Hello, I'm Sula, host of Sula's Big Adventures, and this is chapter 10 of my multi-part series, Sula's Complete Video Guide to Becoming an Amateur Astronomer. Chapter 10, eyepieces, diagonals, and filters for your telescope. The most important accessory to your new telescope is the eyepiece. If you bought a telescope kit that came with eyepieces, chances are they're not very high quality. The manufacturer will put low quality eyepieces in in order to cut costs. Sometimes the kit will include a cheap Barlow that you should probably discard. Although some eyepieces can be more expensive than the telescope itself, they will last forever and they can be used on other telescopes you may buy or upgrade to in the future. In this episode, I'm going to go over the different kinds of eyepieces to consider and how to choose. I'm also going to cover star diagonals and filters. Eyepieces come in varying focal lengths, listed in millimeters, anywhere from 55 millimeters to three millimeters. They're almost always for one and a quarter inch focusers, although sometimes they're for two inch focusers. First, let's talk about calculating the power of any given eyepiece. The formula for determining the magnification of any eyepiece is to take the focal length of your telescope, usually printed on the telescope tube, and divide that by the focal length of your eyepiece. For example, my six inch refractor has 1200 millimeter focal length, so a 24 millimeter eyepiece will give 50 times magnification. Now let's talk about how much of the sky you can see with any given eyepiece. That will depend on the magnification and the apparent field of view. Sometimes the eyepiece will list the apparent field of view on the eyepiece itself. For example, this Explorer Scientific 16 millimeter eyepiece has a 68 degree apparent field of view. You can also hold an eyepiece up to a light and the diameter of the circle that you see is the apparent field of view in degrees. Typically an eyepiece will have anywhere from uh, 40 degrees all the way up to 100 degree apparent field of view. Once you find out the magnification that any eyepiece will provide your telescope, then you can calculate the true field of view by dividing the apparent field of view of the eyepiece by the magnification as used in that telescope. So in our example of the six inch refractor with a 1200 millimeter focal length, if we use a 24 millimeter eyepiece with an apparent field of view of 68 degrees, then we have 68 degrees, the apparent field of view divided by the magnification, which we calculated to be 50, for a 1.3 degree true field of view. Remember from an earlier episode that the full moon is half a degree. So lots of sky to see with an eyepiece with a 68 degree apparent field of view. Sorry about all the insects. We also have those biting black flies here in Montana because my neighbor is a rancher and he has cows. Anyway, for your telescope, you will probably want a low power, like this 32 millimeter, a medium power, and a high power eyepiece. One thing to consider when choosing an eyepiece is eye relief. That's the distance your eye must be from the eyepiece in order to see the whole field of view. Shorter eye relief is uncomfortable to most people, and usually the higher the power, the shorter the eye relief. Just as with camera lenses, eyepieces are coated in order to improve light transmission. A single layer of magnesium fluoride applied to the eyepiece exterior would be a minimum, with several layers being the norm. There are several types of eyepieces and they are usually named after the inventor. There is the Kellner, and it is an eyepiece that, I don't have one here, uh, it's a low-end eyepiece. It uses three elements, a design, and they usually have only 40 degree field of view. 
Next, there are arthros arthroscopic, um, hard to find now, but they use four element lenses, a triplet and then a single lens. And they usually have 45 degrees apparent field of view. Um, they've been replaced now by plossils, but um, orthoscopic are still made by a few companies such as Botter Planetarium. The old ones are highly sought after by planetary observers. Next are plossils, like this one. And plossil is not uh, unique to any company. Many companies make plossils. It was devised in 1860 by George Plossil, and they're still sold today. And they also have four elements, but they have two elements and then two other that are nearly identical. And they usually have about a 50 degree field of view. Many companies manufacture plossils, and some are even made with five to seven elements. Um, I think this Teleview is, and it has uh, a 60 degree field of view, I think. Mead, for example, has a super plossil, and Celestron makes the XL, and those uh, also usually have 20 millimeters of eye relief. Uh, Teleview's plossil design called the Delight, which I have one right over here, has a 62 degree field of view. This uh, particular Teleview D-Light, I don't know why I bought it, it's three millimeters, which is, um, that's about as powerful as they make eyepieces. And I, I hardly ever use it because uh, it, conditions have to be superb for it to really be useful. Uh, next are wide angle eyepieces and they can come all the way up to a hundred degree field of view, but at a steep price. These usually have five to eight elements and they're expensive and heavy. And then next, there are Naglers and I have one over here that I love. This is my Teleview seven millimeter Nagler type six. And this is a fantastic eyepiece and I use it a lot. Um, they also make the Ethos class and these have six to nine elements and are 80 to 100 degree apparent field of view. They're very expensive, heavy and large. Then there are Barlow lenses. And I have a couple here. These have a concave or negative lens that multiplies the power of any eyepiece you put with it, usually two or three times. This one's two times and this one's three times. There are also zoom eyepieces. I've never used one. I've, everything I've read about them said they're not very good. <laughs> they usually only have 40 degree apparent field of view. And there are also coma correctors that you put in your focuser. And these are good for fast uh, Newtonians like this one. This 10 inch Dobsonian is F uh, 4.7. So if you have a fast Newtonian reflector, F4 or 4.7 like this, your telescope probably has some edge of field aberration. And this can be corrected by adding a coma corrector to the focuser and that then accepts the eyepiece just like a Barlow does. I don't own one, um, but they're recommended for Dobsonian, so something to look for. And if your telescope is a Dobsonian, maybe you should look into getting a coma corrector for your focuser. If your telescope came with two Kellner eyepieces, 
you could vastly improve your visual stargazing experience by upgrading to even a couple of high quality plossels. Or you could buy a two time Barlow such as this Orion Shorty and that would replace the need for a second medium power eyepiece. Or you could get a set of say 25 millimeter, 12 millimeter and seven millimeter plossels and you could get them from Mead. Uh, Mead makes the Super Plossel, Orion makes Plossels, and they're moderately priced. And if you already own a set of 25 and 10 millimeter, say, eyepieces, you might consider investing in a good 32 millimeter eyepiece with an expanded field of view. This will become your go to eyepiece. I recommend the Teleview Pan Optic. 32 millimeter. I use this Teleview 32 millimeter pan optic a lot and I also have the 24 millimeter. It's an excellent wide angle eyepiece. For a medium range eyepiece I really like the one I was holding a minute ago. The Explorer Scientific 16 millimeter. It has a 68 apparent field of view. I looked over my eyepieces and my collection is dominated by Teleview. Um, they're excellent high quality eyepieces and I recommend them. For planets you should also consider a high power eyepiece or a two time Barlow or three time Barlow added to an existing eyepiece. Teleview makes the Delight series that's my Teleview pan optic and the Delight was the three millimeter I was holding up that I don't use often but uh, they also come in uh, four millimeter and they also have the Delos series in three and four millimeter with huge field of view. But keep in mind though that your telescope has a maximum useful magnification usually listed by the manufacturer in the owner's manual. The most used eyepieces that you have will be the ones that provide magnification somewhere in the range of 7 to 25 times the telescope's aperture in inches. For example, my 6 inch refractor, I mostly would use the 32 millimeter Teleview pan optic and to get it in closer I might put in an 11 millimeter which provides 109 times magnification. I can only use this three millimeter if there are exceptional viewing conditions, which is not often. There is usually turbulence or some uh, low clouds that you can't even see. Uh, and um, it's not very often that I could use this three millimeter. I, I'm not sure why I bought it. <laughs> um, because I'm exceeding the telescope's useful magnification. Some eyepieces that I have not tried, which, which are highly rated, are the Orion Lanthanum series. It has an 80 degree field of view. Stellar View makes a 15 millimeter eyepiece with an 82 degree apparent field of view. And Stellar View also makes the 13 millimeter with a 100 degree field of view. Celestron, Luminos, Omegron, uh, Panorama all have 100 degree field of view. Bodder uh, Planetarium Hyperion Aspheric makes a 31 millimeter with a 72 degree field of view. And that sounds pretty good, but I've never tried it. So those are some things to consider when purchasing some eyepieces for your telescope. I highly recommend investing in at least one um, low power, uh, big apparent field of view eyepiece like the Teleview Pan Optic. Those are fantastic eyepieces. Now for diagonals. And, uh, we're looking at a Dobsonian and they don't take diagonals. But refractors and catadioptric telescopes use diagonals and um, uh, they will usually come with a diagonal and it's not usually very high quality. 
the diagonal on my Mead Schmidt Cassegrain is not very high quality and I, I plan to replace it. I do have some diagonals here. This one is an excellent diagonal made by Botter Planetarium that I use on my six inch refractor. They make you, or at the time I bought it, buy the nose piece and the eye piece separately. Um, but this is a very good diagonal and replacing your diagonal can really make a difference in your viewing experience. Particularly if you bought a low end telescope, if you bought a very low end telescope and it came with an Amiki erect image diagonal, you need to toss that because those are for terrestrial viewing. They are made erect image because when you're looking in the day, you want it to be right side up, but that doesn't matter when you're viewing the night sky. So you should replace that. It also introduces diffraction spikes and fuzziness. And so definitely upgrade if you have an erect image diagonal. Or you might want to upgrade your one and a quarter IP uh, diagonal like this one to a two inch diagonal. But if your telescope came with a cheap diagonal, you can improve your visual experience by upgrading to a better diagonal with high quality reflective coatings like this Bajor Planetarium one, which will improve the sharpness and the brightness of the image. Note that some of them are heavy. This one's not, and I like it a lot, but this Apertura dielectric is heavy. Um, and uh, so just keep that in mind. Next, let's talk about filters. You will probably find that you do not use filters very frequently. I know I don't. You certainly don't need a whole set. Eyepiece filters screw into the bottom of the eyepiece. They have screws on the inside on the bottom. Or you could, um, not on this one, but some diagonals you could uh, set it in the diagonal and then if you change eyepieces, the filter is still there. I always just screw it into the bottom. Keep in mind that I'm talking about eyepiece filters, not filters intended for astrophotography. You might want a few filters. I don't have one, but you might want a moon filter if you look at the moon a lot because the moon is so bright it can blind you and that might be helpful to you. You might want uh, one of the colors. Um, the filters come in colors and the light red will help increase the contrast on Mars. And I think that's what <laughs> this filter is. I wrote Mars on it. Um, I haven't used it yet because Mars is uh, got to get up <laughs> late in the evening and not early in the morning for me to look at it. I did see it um, a couple of weeks ago because we stayed up extremely late. Um, can't get this open, but I think this is uh, a light red uh, for Mars. And when it gets closer to Earth, I will use this and I'll let you know if it really works. Um, I would recommend a nebula filter these increase the visibility of emission nebulae, planetary nebulae, and supernova remnants. The way they work is that they only allow the transmission of certain wavelengths of light. Light is emitted at wavelengths anywhere from 400 to 700 nanometers. Now, since nebulae emit light mostly from ionized oxygen, atoms, which are on this wavelength spectrum at 496 to 501 nanometers, a filter that blocks other wavelengths and only allows those wavelengths emitted in this narrow band will make the nebula pop. There are different kinds of nebula filters. There are broadband or deep sky filters that allow light to pass in the red and green band of that wavelength spectrum. 
and these are called broadband filters, and they're made by Astronomic, CLS, Lumicon, and Orion. A narrower band of filter is called an Ultra High Contrast, or UHC, and this is a narrow band filter good for urban areas and for blocking light pollution and improving the visibility of nebula. Then there are ultra narrow band filters that allow in only light from doubly ionized oxygen called O3. And that's what this filter is from Orion, an O3 filter. And I have used this uh, many times and I think it's excellent. It really makes the emission nebula pop once you add it to the eyepiece. And I will show you drawings because that's the only way I can think of to demonstrate the difference in what you see through your eyepiece of an emission nebula and what you see once you add an O3 filter to your eyepiece. These O3 filters are excellent for bringing out detail in objects such as the Helix Nebula, the Swan Nebula, which is M17, one of my favorite objects, the Veil Nebula, NGC 6990 or 6995 or 6992, and the Lagoon Nebula, M8, for example. There are other ones. And they also work on planetary nebula, um, like the blinking planetary nebula and uh, Ghost of Jupiter, although I haven't tried it on that one yet. These oxygen filters are made by a few companies. The one that I have is made by Orion. Lumicon, Celestron, Teleview, Thousand Oaks also make oxygen three filters. Some people say they don't work well on slow telescopes like my Mead 12 inch, which is F10, but I have found that this oxygen three filter works great. For example, I looked at the Swan Nebula a couple of nights ago, and it, it looks pretty darn good <laughs> to begin with, but once I put this filter on, it looks superb. And um, I'll try to demonstrate that for you. I also bought this filter. It looks to be blue, and I wrote Jupiter on it. Uh, so I, I think this uh, blue filter is thought to bring out um, the bands of Jupiter better. And when Jupiter starts getting up at a more decent hour, this is medium blue. I will try this out. I haven't had the opportunity yet. Uh, and there are other colors that do specific things, but like I said, I think you're gonna find that you don't use filters very often. But I do really like this O3 filter. Now I'm in a Bortle 3, so I can already see deep sky objects pretty well and it just makes them even better. But I, I have read that they don't work so well in light polluted areas, but what the hell does? You gotta go to dark skies like I've been saying for months. Anyway, that's all I have to say about filters, diagonals, and eyepieces. And I hope you found this information useful. Go upgrade your eyepieces that came with your kit telescope and improve your visual experience. And get out there and enjoy the dark skies. So long till the next time. Sula signing off.